be a great pleasure to welcome you all for this uh, last session, last seminar for a very busy year for Emerge Africa uh, here in 2015. Uh, we are very happy to uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Efraim Maslanga from the South African Institute for Distance Education. Before, during this week we'll speak about uh, quality assurance in the educational resources and e-learning. Uh, we know this is a topic that draws a lot of interest and, and we're happy to, to raise this uh, topic as well. Um, so welcome to the participants and also uh, a warm welcome to you, uh, Ephraim. And apologies for the slight delay, but uh, luckily we are all online and ready to start. Ephraim, uh, the room is yours and Yes, you can go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's, um, um, it's a privilege for me to participate in this seminar and have an opportunity of sharing with all the participants on matters relating to quality in online learning. I, I think it's a, it's a very topical issue these days in most of our African countries, particularly in the Southern African region, mainly with ministries of education as well as with national quality assurance agencies. As, as, as we will discuss during the course of the seminar today, national authorities are, are concerned about the regulation of uh, online learning, not only by local institutions, but also by foreign providers. And so the advent of online learning, I think, has speeded up this process of cross-border provision of um, higher education. Indeed, it is um, something that poses a lot of challenges in terms of its quality regulation and, in fact, um, in terms of many other aspects. And so I have a particular interest in uh, looking more into this area in terms of uh, getting to know what is happening on the ground in the various countries, but also in collaborating with interested people um, in terms of coming up with um, reasonable mechanisms by which online learning can be regulated and improved in terms of quality. And so thank you very much for providing me with this opportunity to share ideas on, on quality issues in online learning. Let me start by um, reminding participants of the resource that I uploaded early in the week. Um, it's a good practice guide on e-learning and on, it is from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Although it looks like a medical kind of resource, it is actually very useful in terms of the general principles of uh, quality assuring e-learning. Um, a number of quality issues that are raised there but in the resource guide, I think, are very relevant to other disciplines other than medicine. So I hope you had um, an opportunity to just browse through the document and some of the things that we will discuss in this seminar um, are actually in that document. So I would like to um, start by looking at the few slides that I put together. And I believe I'm sharing my, my screen with all the participants. And um, my first slide there alludes to the increasing uh, nature of uh, online learning in its various forms. In our, in our African countries. And, and um, if one looks at the number of learners or students 
who are taking part in online courses, you will see that they are indeed on the increase. I'm not sure if there is any one of you who has had an opportunity to actually look at the statistics at national level or at regional level in order to see um, the trends. So whether you look at it uh, from the point of view of uh, number of students participating in online courses or you look at it from the point of view of the number of online courses that are being offered in our countries or the number of institutions that are offering online courses, you will find that the general trend is that of um, an increase. And, and, and what therefore it means is that we actually have more and more people in our countries who are doing online courses and therefore the quality aspect becomes very key in that, from that perspective. And that's why um, the local authorities like local uh, or national uh, quality assurance agencies and ministries of education are becoming more and more concerned about um, the quality of those online provisions. And I believe that um, it, it, it therefore poses a challenge to us to be able to contain um, that development in terms of developing um, a reasonably good quality assurance framework that, that, that can ensure that um, the courses that are being offered are indeed credible courses. But also, we need to inform people within our countries, especially when it comes to cross-border provision, in terms of the sort of things they should look at so they can be able to individually evaluate the credibility of the courses that are offered by transnational providers before they can enroll on those courses. There is a lot of frustration in most instances when one goes through a course and they get some kind of certificate, but only to realize that it's not even recognized at, 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 um, at the local level. So we would, I think, do well by providing relevant information, probably in the form of a quality assurance framework to our people, so they can be able to evaluate those courses. And so, if I can move on to my next slide, which, 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 which talks about the contestations there are around issues of quality and quality assurance. Not only uh, from an online uh, point of view, but, but, but uh, just in education generally. Um, people have raised um, um, quality issues uh, with respect to distance education provision, and now the, the, the same issues are being raised with regards to online learning as well as blended learning. And, and a number of questions were, 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 were uh, posed um, early in the week regarding um, the quality of online learning and the quality of online courses. Um, again, let me say they are not unique to online courses and online learning. The same questions actually have been raised even for the traditional face-to-face -face contact programs and contact learning, as well as for distance education. Such questions as, what does quality really mean when it comes to online learning? And who sets the quality standards? Whose standards are we talking about here? And in whose interest are those standards are? Right? And is, is quality in any way context specific? Is what is called quality in Zambia the same as what we might call quality in South Africa and what might be called quality in Mauritius? So is there a sense in which um, quality can be something that is very context specific? Again, um, we will discuss that and I would love to hear your views on that. Um, are, we, are we relying or over relying on quality standards that have been developed in other contexts? And to what extent, therefore, do we find them um, appropriate? 
and again we see this happening um, we see this happening quite a lot in a number of um, countries in a number of um, um, programs that I see being uh, quality assured we see a lot of uh, standards that have been developed in other contexts being being actually used and I think the, the, the reason is that there are no local or locally uh, relevant standards and so people have to look around for what exists and use that but the question is to what extent are they are they relevant right and I did pose also the question on the specific challenges that um, people are facing in their context with regards to quality assuring online learning. So it's all those questions that I hope we will be able to at least maybe generate some ideas on which might eventually yield answers um, as we, as we uh, proceed with our seminar this week. But the big question that, that I raised in that slide is when we, when we ask about standards, when we ask about quality, when we ask about quali uh, quali uh, quality assurance, it, it raises the question of whether indeed quality is something that is like beauty, which lies in the eyes of the beholder. What do you think? And, and if we accept that, then we, we accept what, what, what generally is called the relativist knowledge of quality. The relativist knowledge of quality uh, acknowledges that quality can be different from context to context, if not perhaps from person to person. Right? But there are also people who argue that uh, in so far as the services industry is concerned, education included, we should go for the objectivist notion of quality. In other words, where quality exists, everybody can be able to see that is there. And where it doesn't exist, we can all be able to see that there is no quality. Again, um, it's something that you may consider to be very contested. So basically, um, we, we, we have to tease out whether in online learning, we would be better off going by the relativist notion of quality or the objectivist notion of quality. If you ask me uh, for my personal opinion, I'll tell you that even if you go for the relativist notion of quality, there is a sense in which what you do is compared implicitly or explicitly to what happens in other contexts. In other words, you don't do what you do within a vacuum. You actually also look at other contexts and you emulate the standards that prevail elsewhere. And, 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 and therefore, um, your quality then has to be comparable to the quality that is offered um, in other contexts. So yes, um, maybe there is a sense in which it can be argued that uh, quality is like beauty and uh, it does lie in the eyes of the beholder. But there is also a sense in which it can be used, it can be argued that that quality, however, is comparable to um, quality in other contexts. I will be very much interested to hear your views on this aspect as, as, as the seminar um, unrolls this week. I move on to the next slide where I have a diagram, a triangle with uh, two blue things. One looks like a quality ball and the other one looks like a wedge that is supporting the quality ball. The triangle is in fact a hill and I call that the quality ball the quality ball on the hill. The whole diagram is the quality ball on the hill. It's not my original idea. It's an idea that I borrowed from Coach, who is one of the experts in quality assurance who tried to illustrate the idea of uh, benchmarking standards 
within a context and ensuring that you con you continually improve on your standards, you continually improve on your quality, perhaps until you need quality that prevails anyway under the sun. And so, yes, um, I, I, I prefer to use this model in this seminar because I believe it addresses it, most of the questions that we that we raised in the previous slide um, is, is is quality relative in other words um, is there a sense in which we can look at quality of online learning um, is something that is contextual and who defines the quality so if you take the analogy of a hill I think that diagram seems to have been distorted when when I emailed it or when we uploaded it but I think we can still be able to see the sense. So on the vertical axis on the triangle, which is our hill, is our, our standards of excellence. So at the very at the very bottom, at the very horizontal line, I mean this the standards are very, very low. If at all they are there. But as you go up uh, the vertical uh, axis, the standards of excellence improve. So who defines quality in a given context. The people within that context have to define their quality. In other words, um, quality then is um, the standards that you set yourselves to achieve within a given period of time. right? And so the, the, the quality ball there on the slope is, is, is your quality. You peg it at a certain level along the quality slope, the hill slope. And then for you to be able to keep your quality ball at that level, you have to invest a lot of effort, a lot of resources in sustaining that ball where it is, at least. So that, that which looks like a small blue triangle standard is the wedge that you use, is the effort that you put in order to keep the ball at that level on the hill slope. Otherwise, if you lax, that ball is going to roll down the slope, and therefore your quality is going to roll down. Your quality is going to get poorer and poorer and poorer. Okay, but you do not only invest your efforts in your context in order to keep your quality ball at a static level. You, you try as much as possible to continue to improve it Okay, I can see here that I cannot illustrate what I want to illustrate through the triangle. Let me see. Oh, yes, I can. You see, when your ball reaches the peak, we started with that which looks like, um, is, it, is, it, is it a red or brown triangle? You push your ball, quality ball, up to the peak of that um, red triangle. You don't sit on your laurels. You then set higher standards which is now your green thing. And so you have a peak, a new peak. You have a new standard that you set yourselves again to achieve. And that's why I believe that um, in setting your standards, you always look at what is happening and what is prevailing elsewhere. So although in the first instance, you pushed your quality ball up to the peak of the red triangle, you were not contented that that's, 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 that's where you should sit in terms of your quality because you are looking at what is happening elsewhere and hence you set even higher standards and you strive towards achieving those standards. So you continue to push your quality ball up that green triangle until it reaches the peak of the green triangle. And, and when it does, um, you again set new standards. So you continue to set yourselves new standards. You continue to invest in pushing your quality ball up the hill. You continue to improve your standards of excellence. And, 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 and therefore, that's how your quality will improve. And so, yes, you set your standard. Quality is set or defined by the people within a context. But within, um, within in the light of what is happening in other contexts, um, quality has to continue to improve rather than remain in the same place. This is particularly true when it comes to uh, courses that make use of technology, 
because your, te your technology changes, the nature of the knowledge is changing, even the profile of students is changing, and so you continue to change the way you do things, you continue to improve your quality. That's the whole idea behind um, that, that uh, diagram on quality as a standard set and the quality ball on the hill illustration. Again, I would invite your comments during the course of this week on that, especially as it relates to quality in online or in blended learning. Okay, um, I, I need to move on to the next slides where I try to articulate the quality aspects, but at a very broad, at a very general level. In, in online learning, what, what, what is it that constitutes quality? Or where should, we, uh, where should we fix our quality standards? What, 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 what should we look at in order to improve the quality of our offerings? Um, yes, of course, in the very instance, the design of those online courses becomes very critical. And there are a lot of things that one has to consider when it comes to the designing of online courses and of blended courses. And during the course of the week, again, I can be able to articulate some of those design issues. Now, assuming now you have your properly uh, uh, online course that is well designed, and the quality assurance of that designing process has been done, you then roll out that course. What then you need to ensure happens well is the quality of the learner support. How are the learners who are going to participate in that online course going to be supported? And, and you, you, you have to know the profile of your learners. And you have to be conscious of the fact that the learners are different, different in terms of uh, their interests, different perhaps in terms of their capabilities, and different in terms of how they choose to learn. So various forms of support have to be built into the whole course in order to cater for the different learners that you have. Again, we can debate issues of um, learner support during the course of this um, this week. Um, the way you support learners has profound influence on the quality of learner or student engagement, engagement with the content of the course. And I think that's one very important thing in quality assurance that one has to look at. Um, in what way are students engaging with the course. So that's, that's what we want to maximize because that's what will give students certain experiences from which they will then gain the knowledge, the skills, and the whole range of competencies which you expect them to get out of that course. And so, yes, if we are to think of um, quality, I think we should think of quality around those four main areas. The, the way the course is designed, the quality of learner support, the quality of student engagement that happens during the course of learning, and, and then the knowledge, skills, and competencies that, that students um, derive out of the course. But um, there are a lot of other things, like, for instance, assessment, student assessment that are included in these stages. And, and one has to uh, unpack each and every one of those four aspects in order to be able to come up with um, proper quality standards. OK, um, I, I thought. Perhaps what I should do is to look at quality issues in online support. When we support online learners, um, what, 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 what is it that constitutes quality? Um, 
I, I draw a lot from uh, Gary Salmon, and I'm sure most of you are already familiar with uh, Gary Salmon's work. And um, I don't know if you would like me to just run a short video clip during this presentation of what she thinks about what happens when learners learn online and therefore how the online facilitator should support those learners. Um, let me start by just giving the, the five stages she gives that when you first of all take a course online, you, you battle with um, um, access issues, you battle with um, issues of motivation. And then when you are comfortable with the access issues, you then get into a stage she calls online socialization. After online socialization, you get into exchanging information with other students you meet virtually. And thereafter, you feel so confident that you start to construct knowledge. And, and, and then after that, you are such a mature person, you have reached the development stage, you can be able to construct knowledge, you can be able to even contribute to the building of certain theories relating to a particular subject area. And so maybe I shouldn't explain this, but rather, let me um, let me ask Jacob to play us this short video clip where Gilly explains what exactly is involved at each and every one of those stages. I think what is important is for us to be able to pick what the student is capable of doing, the online learner, and how the facilitator should support the student at that stage. Let's, let's, let's watch that short video, okay? Swinburne University of Technology. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Professor Jilly Salmon. And I'm the author and the original researcher of the five-stage model. I'm going to explain the five-stage model as a scaffold to you, which will help you to design online and blended courses that actually do help to keep your students engaged all the way through the process. So, to tell you about the five-stage model, there are five levels, as you would expect, but there's actually 15 components. Now, I'm going to describe the 15 components to you. The first one is that you do actually have to have people to have access. And I'm Professor Gillian. Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone, I'm Professor Jilly Salmon and I'm the author and the original researcher of the five-stage model. I'm going to explain the five-stage model as a scaffold to you, which will help you to design online and blended courses that actually do help to keep your students engaged all the way through the process. So, to tell you about the five-stage model, model. I'm going to explain the five-stage model as a scaffold to you which will help you to design online and blended courses that actually do help to keep your students engaged all the way through the process. So to tell you about the five-stage model, there are five levels as you would expect but there's actually 15 components. Now I'm going to describe the 15 components to you. The first one is that you do actually have to have people to have access to your technology environment, whatever platform you're using, the learning management system, the social media system, your mobile applications. And they have to have both access to get in and of course motivation. And at the beginning, there may be a few issues around the technological access. So I'm gonna put that green block there just to remind you 
that they need to have access. They don't need to know everything about the platform you're using, but they do need to be able to get in, not just once, not just twice, but many, many times. And then they will need some human intervention to help them do that. Now, this is the person that I call the e-moderator, who provides support throughout the scaffold to make sure that they get to the end of it with a very productive learning experience. So we're going to make the e-moderator blue. And the role of the e-moderator at the beginning is to welcome them and to provide support and motivation for them to go on. Don't try and teach them anything yet. And then, of course, the learning itself, we'll make that yellow at the beginning. It's learning to take part. It's learning to log on. It's learning to come back frequently. So we'll give the learning yellow. You're starting to get the idea of this now. So then stage two is the stage that I call the start of online socialization, of culture building, of starting to build your own little learning set for however long you want your course to last. And at this stage, they will need to be able to take part in the online area. And so number two in the green, the technology environment part, they will need to know how to navigate around, they'll need to know how to respond to others. You yeah, need to know all the features, that's not important, but they do need to know how to take part, how to contribute. And then on that side, we've got the role of the human intervention, the person I call the e-moderator, and he or she is really like a host at a cocktail party, introducing people to each other, making sure people are comfortable, that they've got their basic needs satisfied. So the learning at this part really takes part in three ways. One, they need to start forming a team, getting to know others. Two, they need to be familiar with why they're working online for this course. And thirdly, I'm going to squeeze it in the middle. They need to have some idea of what's coming up that's relevant for the course that they're studying. Don't give them hard things to do at this point. They won't be successful and you'll lose many of them. So you can see we've got to stage two. This team is starting to be built. You can start to see that you're starting to build a scaffold with different components. So the next stage is very much about information exchange. You need to get the learners actually working together to exchange either known information to them or information that they can find. So we'll give them a very nice solid block in the middle there. And this is where you need to design your activities to enable them to take part. Um, and they won't need very much technical help at this point, but you might want to make sure that the links are all working, that they can navigate around, that they really feel that they're familiar with the environment by this point. And the role of the e-moderator at this point is to design really good e-tivities and then to support them by giving feedback, to have a presence in that area. So you can see you've got stage three, there's two more to go. So the next stage is very much about knowledge construction. So we're going to give them some really good planks and columns. You can make the activities at this stage more complex, uh, not um, necessarily about known knowledge, but about constructing new knowledge. You'll obviously have to make sure that they can take part in whatever environment or environments you've chosen. And you also need to make sure that everyone is taking part and everyone has a key role. But of course, you're building on a scaffold on planks that have gone before. And what's the role of the e-moderator at this stage? Well, they actually do rather less. They do rather less, but they do it much more carefully. And the role of feedback is still extremely important. And so we come to the fifth stage of the model. And this is where we want students to benefit by looking back for looking forward. 
a bit of metacognition, um, looking back to see the role that they've taken all the way through, revisiting some of it, revising some of the learning that's gone on. And you may have assessment. Um, so the role here is very much to enable people to move both backwards and forwards through the online course. And of course, there might be some assessment that we'd have to add at that point, um, formative or summative assessment. Um, and then probably not a lot um, in terms of the technology environment. So that's the five stage model. If you use it to structure your online or your blended courses, I promise you'll have a lot more learners at the top than if you didn't work through those stages. So good luck. I hope you can build it into your Carpe Diem workshops, share it with others and let us know how you get on. Bye for now. This has been a Swinburne production. And in terms of quality, that we look at each stage as facilitators being able to plan how best to support learners at a given stage. It is also important, you know, for online facilitators to remember that not if you are handling a big group of uh, students, how big? Even something like 15 or 20, not all of them actually will progress through those five stages at the same pace. Some are likely to move faster than others. So planning to be able to handle those different types of students is very important when it comes to online um, support. So yes, um, that's that's um, one area where we really need to see that we, we build quality uh, in so far as the online support process is concerned, but also we, we, we want to ensure that through our support, we actually find mechanisms of supporting and motivating those students to want to remain um, engaged in the online course and therefore experience success. Complete the course and get whatever certificate, if it is a certificate they should get at the end. So the, the, the real issue about motivating learners and, and pushing them towards success, I believe, lies in this model, in these different ways of supporting our students at different stages in the online learning process so that they, they, they enjoy the learning process. Let me move on to the last slide in the presentation where I'm saying but you see, learning is a purposeful activity. You write in the beginning, when you plan your online course, I think it is, it is important for one to, uh, to sit back and say, what is it that the online learners will learn? And, and therefore, as a facilitator, you will have to be very clear on that aspect. In other words, online about tinkering with the technology and with this content and talking and chatting with other peers, it is a purposeful activity that is intended to achieve specific objectives. And those objectives have to be very clear to the person who designs the course and the person who facilitates the online course. And then you should also consider why your learners should learn that? Is, is, is that course useful? Why do you give it to a particular target group? Right? That also is very important. And when you've established that, think of how those learners will learn. They are online learners. They have very different uh, capabilities. Probably they are of different ages. They are located in different contexts. They want to study different times, 
and the different paces. How are they going to learn? Do you have a sense of how they will learn and therefore how you are likely to best support them? And when you have established that, you have to have a way of uh, establishing that indeed they have learned. In other words, assessment, assessment and other checking methods have to be built into your course and into your uh, facilitation process. And so, um, colleagues, um, I, I think these are some of the things that we should think about when it comes to online facilitation. I just want to end by citing a few things, again, uh, from a document that I didn't upload, but perhaps which I should upload between today and tomorrow from Brown University, which, is, which, which, which gives best practice in terms of teaching online or facilitating online, right? The issue of uh, engaging with your student as often as possible is very key. The facilitator must make sure that they engage with their students quite often. Don't, don't, don't leave online students to be on their own for, for too long. You have to be part and parcel of that whole learning process. Although they chat um, with each other, they exchange ideas, I think the facilitator voice must also be heard in that process. You must review and comment in the discussion forum at least a day. Um, there was a course that I was facilitating on quality assurance on behalf of the AAU some time. We needed a lot of people, I think about 30 or so people from different countries, and most of them were from quality assurance agencies um, as well as from um, quality assurance units of institutions. And one day it so happened that I was traveling, and just for that day, and I didn't manage to log in and post. Um, and respond to comments in the discussion forum. When I logged in the following morrow, I saw a lot of questions that were saying, but where is our facilitator, guys? But where is the facilitator today? There is that expectation by online learners that um, the facilitator will always be posting his ideas, his responses, his comments on what they will be uh, talking about virtually. And so it is important that the facilitator always posts comments uh, in the discussion forum. And you must always provide feedback, effective feedback to the online learner. Some of the comments are just posted there uh, in order to taste whether um, the views are correct or not. And there is the expectation on the part of online learners that the facilitator will play the role of uh, correcting some of those views. And also manage, train your online, online learners to manage their time wisely. T time is one of those tricky issues when it comes to online learning. Whilst online learning is good in the sense that um, it provides that flexibility on where and when to learn, the management of time also becomes quite a big challenge. And so we have to support them in uh, managing time if they are to succeed. Mm -hmm. and, and it is also recommended that at the uh, online course design stage, it is important for an academic who is a content expert to consult with an instructional designer who will help because of the experience the designer has on learning theory and on online teaching methodologies. It would be highly beneficial if an academic can consult with such online designers in order to design the best course. So, in a nutshell, these are some of the quality issues I thought I could share with you this afternoon in so far as online learning is concerned. I will continue to uh, post comments in the discussion forum as well as uploading whatever resources I pick which I think may be of use to you. Thank you very much. I will entertain any questions that uh, you has that are left. Thank you so much, Brain. Also an encouragement to uh, 
to, to go to, to, to ask your questions. We were a bit delayed due to some sound problems in the beginning, so I hope um, you, our participants, will be such a spare with us and perhaps stay around for another 10, 15 minutes uh, beyond the scheduled, uh, scheduled end time. Okay, that's fine. So, okay, are we, we are we ending this session or are we entertaining? Ephraim, I think that we should have time to uh, just have a look at two or three questions. Uh, perhaps our facilitator or maybe your yourself, Ephraim, have spotted any questions that could be, could be interesting to just to entertain. Yes, uh, Jerome indicates that there are some couple of blending questions there. Yeah, let's have just one of them, Jerome. We may not necessarily be able to answer them, but I think it is worthwhile hearing and thinking about them. I see Jerome is, is typing. Yes, he raises the question of large classes. How do you facilitate large classes? Again, the question always is how large? And, and, and in relation to that question, let me also say my experience with um, institutions has been that at the beginning, they see online learning as a strategy for dealing with large classes. But um, if one is to be an effective uh, online facilitator, I'm sure that um, it is possible to have a class of more than 40 or 50. I would recommend something like 30, 35. And I, I still think even that could be too big a class for one to be able to handle effectively. So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's one of those challenges that people face in online facilitation. I don't know if there's anybody who has had the experience of um, handling such large classes. I'm aware that um, in most instances, you talk of a class of 30, it's a joke, just because of the sheer numbers they are. And people would expect um, a facilitator to handle maybe 200, 300, or even 400. But imagine if they are active online learners and all of them are posting uh, comments in the chat forum and the facilitator is supposed to be going through all of them and threading them and summarizing them. It would be virtually impossible, I think, for one to be able to facilitate a class of 100 or 200. Well, yes, uh, is there any move to have an international body which sets standards of uh, e-learning? There are, there are um, standards that are set by different bodies in different parts of the world. If you look at the US, for instance, you will see a number of bodies that, that give what they consider to be standards, good standards in e-learning, right? I think if you look at... Um, the EADTU, the European Association for Distance Teaching Universities, they do also have their own uh, benchmarks, their own standards. But again, the question will, all, will always arise, to what extent are those standards universally acceptable? And is, is it indeed uh, not better for us to have our own standards within our own context because of, uh, because of the context, because of the conditions that we face in our context? Would it not be better that we can draw from those international standards, but customize them to suit our context? Again, um, that's what I believe. I don't know what your views are. Um, I'm aware that uh, on the African continent, there is the African Council for Distance Education, which to date has developed um, a set of distance education standards. 
but they are also wanting to infuse into those standards are uh, e-learning standards and, and give them to African institutions. Do you have uh, to wait until you have crossed the red, the green, and the, uh, the, the third triangle first? You don't have to wait. In fact, institutions don't wait. Um, individual program, uh, online program designers don't wait. They, there is a certain level of standards that, that you go by in any given context. But the point is, what is important is to know where you are and to aspire to improve. And then you put in place mechanisms to enable you to realize that improvement. Um, okay, Jacob, I think those are some of the few questions I've seen here in the chat room and uh, we may be able to answer some of them during the course of the week, hopefully. Thank you so much, Ephraim. Um, let me just remind once again of our uh, seminar landing page. Um, I'm just taste, tasting a link here where there is access to the discussion forum. Uh, we uh, also will also have access to the, uh, to the recording of this session. And also the video that we were showing a bit earlier, both uh, directly to YouTube and uh, as, as, as a download as well. Um, so let's uh, continue the conversation in the, in the discussion forum. I'm just checking now if there's maybe one last question. Yes. One last burning question that we should be answered before we close the session. Yes. Um, which one is that? Maybe I'm missing it. I see. I'm just looking through here if we, if we have any questions. It doesn't doesn't look like uh, like we have any further questions left. So let's leave that for the uh, for the forum discussions. Yeah. Ephraim, thank you so much uh, for your participation here um, and for presenting. And thank you so much for your for your great patience in getting the technology working. And thank you all our. Participants, uh, this seminar will continue until and including Friday. And during next time, you are most welcome to give your inputs in the discussion forum, the other discussion forum, or our Facebook uh, event page. Okay. I'm wishing you all a pleasant afternoon. And hope thanks, thanks Jacob. And thanks, everybody. And goodbye.